Pastor Randy Needham at the Dwelling Place Church here in Houston. And yeah. <laughs> and Jessica Cooley-Amos and myself will be taking time to interview... Babysit. Huh? And babysit. Chaperone. <laughs> yes, yeah, chaperone and referee. <laughs> uh, an interview with uh, the legendary, uh, iconic Christian leader of our generation for sure, Pastor Benny Hinn. And... Uh, and Michael Kulianos. So uh, if you are on Facebook watching, we want to encourage you also to share, let your friends know to tune in. It's really going to be probably a very provocative and insightful time together. All right, let's give uh, Pastor Benny and Michael a hand as they come. And Jess. Good. We're there we go. Okay. Let's pray. Who's going to pray? <laughs> I'm old fashioned. <laughs> Where's Elissa? Where's Elissa? He's already giving me a hard time. Start in the morning like that. I'm old fashioned. You look marvelous, by the way. Thank you. I like that t shirt. Yeah, I love your shirt. <laughs> it's awesome. It's awesome. Pastor Randy, why don't you make this spiritual? You want to pray? You, why don't you pray? Let's lift our hands and uh, just welcome Jesus. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. We love you. We thank you for the love of the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. And we thank you for directing us. We thank you for the anointing that destroys yokes. We thank you for the wisdom of heaven. And we ask boldly and in faith for the wisdom of God to serve and to walk with you, Jesus. Amen. 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 So we're going to just kind of jump in. To a, a couple of questions, um, I think we'll start with Jess, um, <laughs> uh, or I can start if you'd like. Yeah, I have a really important question. Okay. Um, can you guys hear Jess? Can we give her a little more juice there, please? So, Dad, this is for you. We still can't hear you. Hello, hello. There so, you um, we need him on these monitors here. Who do you love more, Michael or me? Don't answer that. It was a joke. Don't answer that. The Catholic. The yeah. Catholic. That was a good answer right about there. <laughs> now, you're not really asking me that question, right? I will totally not ask you that question, but I was just giving you a hard knows. time. I already know you love me the most. Your mic is no? <laughs> still not working too good. I can't. I just need to talk yeah, a little let's louder. Let's just have a little right here so I can hello, hear Hello, hello. You hear me now? <laughs> okay. I'm not deaf. Thank you. <laughs> Because we have someone that could pray for you if you need healing. <laughs> now they're all taking pictures of that. You yeah. see that? I'm, I'm a little nervous about being up here now. Now, I mean, now you, <laughs> you don't really want me no. to answer the question no. you asked. Oh, no, it was a joke. Because um, I love you both very, very much. It was a joke. You know what? How about Pastor Randy Stark? You're up. So. Uh, Benny, Pastor Benny here, I think. Uh, Why would you ask me questions? Oh, no. Questions? Well, no, you asked the question. Do you have any questions? Do you have any questions? No. No? <laughs> okay. Tim. Okay. Tim. Well, okay, so obviously the scripture speaks about the hearts of the fathers and sons turning towards each other. And we, we hope to, during this time, really get some wisdom from you and and Michael, through hearing your, your journey together and your experience together as, as a father in the ministry to, to Michael. And so a lot of the questions will be geared towards that way. But we want to dig a little deeper. Jesse's going to ask some more personal questions 
Um, I'm going to probably stick Lord it to help me with that one. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I want to start off by asking you, how do you feel in general about this generation of young preachers and young ministries that are rising up? Um, we often share about the son's hearts towards the father. We all love you. We think that you are absolutely legendary. Um, but sincerely, but we want to know what your heart is towards towards the sons, towards this generation. What What's stirring in your heart towards the generation that's up and coming now? Well, I will tell you, first of all, I believe in the scriptural uh, truth about uh, spiritual fathers, uh, because Paul talked about that in the scripture. Now, with me, and I want to start with that, uh, I did not really have that when I began in ministry. I didn't have anyone I could go to for a long time. And I uh, read a lot of books by the great uh, giants of the faith, Andrew Murray, uh, so many of the great uh, fathers back in those days that really touched my life. And then the Lord <clears throat> brought into my life people like uh, Dr. Winston Nunes. Dr. Winston Nunes was probably one of the greatest Bible teachers in Canada. And he's the one who really uh, kind of took a step uh, in helping me. So he asked me to have lunch with him weekly. And at first I wasn't sure how that would go. But he really helped me in ministry a lot. And one of the things, for example, that happened, uh, when, when I began preaching, I was 21, little experience uh, as a minister. And uh, I began thinking <coughs> about uh, starting a church in Toronto. And he's the one who sat me down and said, uh, do not do it and uh, was so wise and saved me from a big problem because it's all about timing. And uh, then there was a wonderful, wonderful man who worked with Billy Graham, uh, a Baptist gentleman, and uh, named actually John Wesley, of all things. And uh, he and I had a, an amazing relationship and he uh, advised me a lot, and he kind of became one I looked up to. And then along the way, surprisingly, men made a decision to uh, help me. So I really never looked for it. They were looking for me. And most people probably don't, don't even know, I was deeply influenced, amazingly, by Baptist preachers. Now, I know this may shock you. If I was not in the healing ministry, I would have been a Baptist. <laughs> oh, because they influenced my life. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Bill Bright was one of them. Mm -hmm. People don't even know that. Uh, from Campus Crusade, you probably heard his name. He and I would have lunches at least once a month when I lived in, in uh, Orlando. Uh, so many, so many. Uh, Tim LaHaye was another one that became very dear and close to me. Jerry Falwell was another one that I met with more than once. He'd make fun of me often, make me laugh, but he would call to check on me when I went through my trials. Uh, most of, that, of, of those that called me were uh, Baptist preachers. Mm. And it was very, very touching. And um, Jerry Falwell would say to me, now Benny, you know, when you lead that worship and you preach the word, it's no, nothing, no, no different from, you know, my church, Thomas uh, Road Baptist Church. But when those miracles begin, it's downhill from there for you, brother. 
uh, he always would laugh at, at, at why people fall. He said, now why uh, do you push them like, do you touch something? And I said, Dr. Falwell, they fall, and I don't know why. Come on, Benny, you should know why. You must push them down. <laughs> I said, can I push anybody down? But anyways, I said, well, how about when I blow on them? He said, yeah, that's, uh, we, we're not sure about that. And he'd go on like that. And one day I said, I said, well, I just don't know. I said, one day I'm going to ask God why they fall. And that kind of took up a little bit. But fathers are important. Now, let me say this, and then I'm, I'm going to have you ask me something else, but because I don't want to dwell on that. Uh, there's also danger with that. Hmm. And the danger is when someone appoints himself as a father who is not qualified because he doesn't have the longevity. It's all about longevity. Jack Hayford, who is my pastor, to me he is a father in the spirit still because when I went through my trials, it was only Pastor Hayford that I could trust. And it's all about trust. Where they're not going to go out and harm you. And talk about what you said to them. So, Pastor Jack said to me, he said, you know why we believe God called you? That happened like uh, not too long ago. I've been in the ministry for 43 years now. He, he says, you know, Benny, he says, we all knew God's hand was on you years ago. But we were not sure about one thing. And then he said, now, do you know why we really believe we as, and he kind of mentioned other pastors like Noel Jones and others. He said, you know why we all believe, and Ken Omar, he and Ken are really close friends, and he said, you know why we all believe God really did call you? So no, longevity. It's the only proof of ministry. It's not the miracles. It's not even God's hand on you. Because I thought, oh, you know, they recognize God's hand is on me. That was, uh-uh, that's not the real answer. God's hand is on many people that he'll dismiss, often dismiss. When they came to the Lord and said in the scriptures, when the Lord spoke about the day that would come, Lord, Lord, in your name, I never knew you. They were dismissed. And something about God, when God dismisses someone, he dismisses even their memory. As though he never knew them. Because it says in 2 Samuel 1.21, it says, as though he was never anointed about Saul. Remember that? As though he was never anointed means dismissed. Even from memory dismissed. So be careful when it comes to fathers. And I know in some places it's, it's uh, more cultural than it is biblical. So we have to stay with what is biblical. So today, you know, I still look up to Pastor Jack and Tommy Reed are the two people I really trust. Mm -hmm. Pastor Tommy from Buffalo. Mm -hmm. I've known him many years. So we need that. But I will also warn, be careful who is uh, influencing your life. Because I will not trust the newcomers. They don't have the foundation. Mm -hmm. And the foundation that you see today is not solid. Why do you think that is? Well, because we've walked away from it. Mm. We've walked away from biblical truth. We, we, we see it out there. Uh, I'm going to get in trouble, I think, now. But, 
There are dangers mm -hmm. in ministry. And you would ask me that question anyway, right? Yes, what are some of well, the dangers? I might as well tell you. <laughs> the dangers in ministry is often, let me say it like this. I made a mistake one day. I got up one, one Sunday morning <clears throat> and I said, uh, I am appointing my wife as pastor of OCC, and she will be equal to me. I did not realize that a week later, the devil would attack her, and I had no idea why. And Jesse remembers that. And the Lord said, uh, who told you to promote her? I had no answer. Now, looking back, after all those years, I've discovered one thing. When God calls you, the second God calls you into ministry, he will anoint you for that. And the minute he anoints you, Satan will assign demons to destroy you. Instantly. The second God anoints you, the enemy will assign demons to destroy you. Now, they cannot destroy you as long as you stay under that anointing. Because the anointing is protection. Psalm 89, verse 20. With my holy oil have I anointed David. The enemy shall not vex him nor the son of wickedness afflict him. That's Bible. So when God anoints you, rather in Psalm 89 it says, the devil cannot touch you. But, but, if you call a family member that God never called, those demons that cannot touch you can touch them and often will destroy them. And most pastors, a lot of pastors, maybe I shouldn't say most, but it seems more and more of them are doing it. They, they are appointing family members into positions God never called them into. They promote children. They promote uh, brothers or other family members not realizing the damage they're going to cause in their life. So I was uh, at a large church in New Jersey a few years ago. And the pastor of this massive church that seats 6,000 and packs it out, would you pray for my wife, he said. Jim was with me. I said, sure. He said, she's home. He called her. I picked up the phone. Hello. I could feel demons coming through that phone. Because she was mentally troubled. Well, I did not know then what I know now. Then I found out later that he promoted her to be co-pastor. I've talked to so many pastors who have said to me, I should have never done it because it caused divorce, emotional troubles, you name it. Because they promote members of family thinking that God is in it when he's not. That's very dangerous. So I will never submit to a man who doesn't know the voice of God because they don't know the scripture. Moses never promoted Gershom or Eliezer. He said, Lord, who's your choice? He said, Joshua. It's what God decides, not what men decide. So it's all about, again, longevity. 
because longevity will teach you all that. Yeah. And that's my advice to all of you is if you're looking for a, a someone to look up to in the spirit, and we all need that, okay? Look at their longevity in ministry, not the anointing on their ministry. The danger is we always look at the anointing, yeah. signs and wonders yeah. and all that. Uh -uh -uh. Longevity, yeah. that's the answer. You, I'm going to turn over you, but you touched on something that was just uh, so many things. Practically speaking, is it complicated when you are the leader of such type of an organization that's successful in growing, whether it's a church or a ministry, and you have family that is growing up, and you have brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and in-laws, like your son-in-law, who is coming up in the ministry, for you to not feel the pressure to give him a job or give him a spot or give him an opportunity because he's your son-in-law. How do you navigate that? I hired uh, three of my brothers, and I fired all three of them. It's very easy to lay hands on mm, and yeah. very tough to lay hands off. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. And my advice is I have not seen that work too well I hear you. with family wow. because they believe and feel that you owe them something. Mm. Now, not in all cases, of course, because biblically speaking, uh, some of the apostles were family members of the Lord himself. And so in our day, it seems it doesn't work because we, we feel pressured. We're not led by the Spirit. But there is some beautiful examples where a family member is truly called of God to help and assist you. And it's, look what's going on with Michael and Jessica. When the hand of God was evident, mm -hmm. I immediately supported them. But I, I, I also know his heart. Mm -hmm. And I love him dearly. He knows that, of course. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, I've had family members say, well, how come you support Michael and you don't support, and they give me the names. I said, because the Lord told me to. Well, why aren't you helping me? Because the Lord didn't tell me to. <laughs> That's all there is to it. You can't say anything else. And the voice of God, please hear this. The voice of God comes line upon line. God never speaks most times like this. He repeats it over and over and over before you know it's the Lord. And he'll speak through different people, circumstances, situations. Before you know in your heart, this is really the Lord speaking to me. So it's not my mind, you know, hearing something one time. And as I looked at Michael, I thought, the Lord is with him. Look at the anointing. And, and it's not about uh, when he stands and ministers. It's about when he's with me alone. What does he talk about? What comes out of his mouth? You can tell a lot by what comes out of their mouth, what they say. I have never heard this man cuss. Never. Never one time. I've heard my brothers cuss. I don't care if we're live. We're, it's the truth. Not all of them. But, but, but I've never heard you say anything out of your mouth that was dishonoring to the Lord. Let no filthy communication proceed out of your mouth. So when you hear someone say something that is not holy, well, you know what's in, you know, inside of him. I've never heard him say anything unholy. 
He makes fun of me. That's about all. He, he, he compares my hair to Mount Tabor. <laughs> and I love him for that, of course. He calls it Taboric. So um, I didn't have this question, but kind of going with that theme, I want to ask Michael now, because I was behind the scenes with the journey. And I can honestly say, um, my dad speaking truth, um, we all had things that we felt called to, Michael and I. And we say, well, come on, you have such a big platform. Just we want to be up there. We want to do this. We want to do that. And we'd almost get offended at times when we weren't. Um, but he would always say, I don't promote you, God does, and I can't do anything until God says so. So, Michael, my question to you, and I know the answer, but I want you to share it with everybody. How was that journey for you, knowing that you were called as a young child when you were serving my dad so, so humbly, doing anything asked of you, started with no pay, just were truly, truly there to serve, but you felt that you had a call on God, of God on your life, and it wasn't seen at that time by him like you were hoping because he was not only your father-in-law, but he was your spiritual father. How did you go through that journey to get you where you are right now? Thank you. That was a long question. What's the question? The, long, the question is, <laughs> I know, I'm a girl, you know, it's like, yeah. But um, so how did you, the question is, how did you stand on what you knew God called you to do, even though at times you did not feel the support of family, including my father, who you so wanted to validate you at times, how did you keep going and stay focused and honor at the same time and still serve? Okay, thank you. Well, um, now that I'm older, I understand a lot of those perspectives that I disagreed with at the time because we all think we're way more ready than God does. And uh, so there are no shortcuts. The, the Lord's not after our ministry. He, he's after forming us into the image of Jesus for a reason, for the sake of Jesus, so that Jesus has a fit bride to commune with. In other words, that Romans 8 process that he, we're conformed into the image of his son, it's unto something. It's unto intimacy with God. So he needs, he needs people, a Jesus people, to commune with. And when that becomes success, like Bub talked about, I call him Bub, by the way, Bubba. And uh, so when, when loving Jesus becomes your, your uh, barometer, when that is success, when oneness that he talked about last night is success, you realize the Lord is not going to leave a stone unturned in us. His ultimate ambition is not to get us to full stadium. I mean, he can do that with someone who's never met him. Do you want me to name a few? Balaam, Judas raised more dead people than anyone here. Uh, Saul died as though he were never anointed. Solomon has a vision of God, brings idols in to the very sanctuary of the Lord. So, so the, doing the stuff is not success. And back then I thought, and you guys walked with me on this journey, Back then, my dream was to fulfill the prophetic word that your dad spoke over me as a boy, which was, uh, which is almost a haunting word. The word was, this young man will carry the anointing to the nations and shake nations with the gospel. So that's what was spoken over me the night I got healed. And, and I didn't know you were supposed to fall, so I was on the ground, and he was just bouncing around the platform like, he's way more calm now. For those of you who knew... My father-in-law in the early 90s, it was like, it was an experience, you know. <laughs> and I was an altar boy at the time in the Orthodox Church. I thought, what on earth is going on? Why am I on my back? And I heard that word. It seemed like it come through like a tunnel, faraway tunnel, like water into my soul. Carry this anointing to the nations, shake the nations with the gospel. Well, I didn't know. I knew what the nations were. I didn't know what the anointing was. I didn't know the gospel I didn't know where I was. And so you live, as Lou Engle says, under an overshadowing, overpowering prophetic word over your destiny. So all I could really think about was doing the work of the ministry at that time. So when, when I became your assistant, which was, <laughs> I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world because uh, some, a 
Mike Miller asked me yesterday, teach me how to flow in the Holy Spirit, and, uh, which was so humble of him. But I'm, there's no class for that. You know, you, you have to live in that atmosphere, and you have to go low. So I started carrying his Bible and, and catching people, <laughs> which is why my back hurts right now. I needed a massage two days ago. I'm still feeling the effects of that. I've had wigs stick to my watch class. I've <laughs> jumped off platforms. I've cast out devils I've, with offering envelopes in my back pocket. I mean, I've, I've, done, I've seen some stuff. I've seen probably the largest healing service in the entire, in, in the history of Christendom. So living in that framework, the barometer for success can be skewed in your heart. It can, you can start to create this perspective that I have to do that. And if I don't do that, uh, I'm not fulfilling my destiny. And the whole time the Lord's saying, you just need to come to me and leave that to me. So when that shifted, now I saw why your dad didn't. At the time, you're like, oh, I can do that. I can heal the sick. I can preach that. But that's not the point. Uh, the point is making us like Jesus. So as now people are coming up in our movement and people close to me, I totally understand why... Um, why God didn't open that door. The level of warfare is so intense. Uh, I mean, I've been to the end of myself this year. It's, you know, a, a, great, a great saint uh, once said, I'm a mystery unto myself. Like, I don't know why God uses me. I, I don't understand why he's been so good. And the level of warfare is... It's almost crippling at times. And had I, had I been thrown 10 years ago into some capacity that God didn't put me, it would have crushed us. It would have crushed our marriage. It would have crushed. The, you know, you, I couldn't put it this way. I cannot go up to a cripple and say, in the name of my father, I'll get up. Or in the name of my spiritual father, get up. At the end of the day... I have to create a history with God. Absolutely. And while he, so he never once taught me how to heal the sick. Just last week at Bethel Cleveland, the only testimony we took for 45 minutes were tumors that vanished. We couldn't get to anything else. It was tumor or cyst or growth after the other. Boom, 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 boom. He never taught me that. He, he never taught me a three-point sermon. He never taught me how to communicate. He never taught me how to fill a stadium. He never taught me. He taught me how to spend time with Jesus. He taught me to go into my room every day. And, and for me to marry you, which was worth the God Almighty, felt like the children of Israel. I definitely had my Jacob and Laban experience with, with him. But he goes, you know, you... He, Let's just be real. So I said, I, I'd like to marry your... No, the first time I took her out, I came to the house. He goes, I remember you. Are you going to marry my daughter? I hadn't seen him in 10 years. So I said, oh, well, I can, sir. I mean, do you want me to? I will. I mean, I didn't know what to say. I was like, sure. Yeah, I'll marry her. So he gave me a lot of money. So take her on a date. So I did. I was like, wow, this is wild. So I took her out. And then he's like, I think you're going to marry her. And so let's wait on the Lord. And finally... <laughs> Finally, the Lord had spoken, and Suzanne hadn't heard yet, so I had to take her out on a date, which was wild. That's a totally separate scenario. I got the yes, though. That's all I can tell you. The gift of wisdom began to flow on that, that date. So I took Jesse and Suzanne out the same, <laughs> the same week, and it worked. And then finally, I said, Pastor Benny, I'd like to marry your daughter. And he said, uh, you don't remember that, this, I'm sure. Here you go. I like the sound of that. Ask me again. And I thought, this is sadistic. This is torture. This isn't right. What is he doing? He goes, ask me again. I said, uh, sir, I'd like to marry your daughter. By this time, I felt like that was this big. So then he said, oh, get the family. Let's do it in front of the family. I said, well, I kind of had something else planned. I thought maybe I could take her, you know, alone. Can we do it that way? He goes, sure, go do it alone. Put the ring on. If she says yes, which I think she will. So he said, Take the ring off. 
and come back and do it in front of the family. <laughs> then he said, I'll fly your family in. Oh, yeah, I'll fly again. your family in, and you can do it with them. So, um, <laughs> so, uh, so then he said, okay. So after he gave me his blessing, what was that? After he gave me his blessing, he said, okay, if you're going to marry Jess, you're going to live in my house. And you're going to be my assistant. And you're going to do it for no money. I was like, what a deal. <laughs> so, so hold on. Let, let me, you know, my, my mind works like line upon line. As he said, I go, okay, so I'm going to work for you. I sleep in your house, which means I'm always going to work for you. And I don't get a paycheck. But I get a beautiful wife. So I just jumped on, on the opportunity. And, and in all seriousness, I feel like in life, I don't know, maybe there's four. I'm not, this isn't Bible. I'm just talking from experience. And people I've studied who have really shifted the world. There seem to be these windows of opportunity that come like four or five times in a lifetime. Different ones. Getting saved. Being filled with the Spirit. Discovering your destiny in the Spirit. Your spouse. So I felt in that moment that that my destiny depended on a leap of faith. So I was a professional golfer at the time. I was coaching the Florida Gators, and I just jumped on it. And Jess actually goes, no, 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 you don't know what you're getting into. If my dad wants it 71 degrees in an auditorium, it has to be 71 degrees. He, he's going to get on you. If he wants his tea warm, he wants it warm. I said, I don't care. I'm doing this. I'm going for it. I don't really don't care what it all looks like or feels like. And so I began to live in the house, and that's where I saw the pattern of a man of God. I began to discover who he is. And so have we been through a lot as a family corporately? Of course. Have, have, have we all been through judgment and, and uh, just horrible accusation? And is there, is there a cost involved? Like I remember one time saying, a uh, guy saying, I was on the way to preach at his church. He goes, I have an issue. I said, what's the issue? He said, are you Benny's son-in-law? I'm on the way to preach. I said, I am. He said, that's a problem. I said, why is it a problem? He goes, it just is. He said, well, what are you going to preach? I said, Jesus. He goes, uh, I need to call you back. He didn't know what to do with that. So, I, I, so um, he called back. I said, look, sir, I need to know. Am I coming or not? He said, well, this is a problem. I said, look, just let me know. So he goes, okay, fine, come. So it was my first time preaching where the entire front row didn't want me there, and it's their church. And part of me wanted to tackle them. The other part of me wanted God to taser them, just like fire from heaven. <laughs> yeah. So I preached the gospel. This was at the University of Florida on campus. You were there. I preached the gospel, man. People got saved. The power of the Holy Spirit fell. And the guy ran up to me. This is what he said. Sorry, brother, you are a Christian. And I thought, I thought, my God, man, the, the measure of judgment, no one knows. Nobody knows what preachers walk through, what they go through, the pressure they do feel to please everyone. And, 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 and it actually reaches the crescendo of, are you even a Christian? So has there been a cost involved? Sure. But you know what? There would be no Jesus image. I'd be sick. To this day, I would not know Jesus. If selling out people who impact us for Jesus is the perceived price of being accepted, they can have it. I'd rather go back to playing golf. This is a political devil that, 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 that we all face. And so I've rectified in my heart, this is my story. This is the truth. I'm not shifting it. So living closely with him, like one time, the Lord said to me in the hotel room, I turned the TV on uh, during my first crusade when I was your assistant. And the Lord said, why is the TV on? I said, because I'm watching it. <laughs> he said, what's Benny doing? I said, he's probably praying. It's after two. He said, have you come here to serve? I said, yes, Lord. He goes, why aren't you praying? That was 2003. To that day, I don't turn a TV on the night I have to minister. So I found a oneness with him. I found a oneness. 
his rhythm became mine. At the same time, I had to build my own habitation, my own well. And uh, so, yeah, those were the challenges, but the challenges brought something forth, you know, that's and what the Lord's done is amazing. Yeah. I have a quick question that I want to let Pastor Randy or Tim um, do a question, but you kind of touched on it. And this is for both of you. Um, but I'll start with my dad. Um, as a daughter, I've just watched so much criticism come your way. You've gone through a lot, and you're still going. And I admire that in you. So how, how have you not let the mean things said? How have you not let, how have you not let the things that have been said about you, um, the people that loved you that have walked away and said mean things, um, the criticism, the hate, how have you not let that affect you? And how are you still going 40 something years later with all that? How do you do it? Wow. Well, baby, that's a precious question. <laughs> and uh, you, you, you almost cried. I did cry. Yeah. <laughs> almost. <laughs> Almost, yeah. Well, yeah. when Dateline NBC attacked me viciously, I was on uh, TBN uh, doing behind the scenes by myself, and the phone rang. And a pastor said to me, how is it possible that you can sit on television in a because I just told him I'd be doing behind the scenes on my own. How can you sit there uh, when tonight they'll destroy you? NBC will destroy you. I said, you know, there's a beautiful scripture in the book of Acts. If this work be of God, you can't fight it. And he said, well, how can he be so peaceful? Because I know this work is of God. There's nothing they can do. And baby, it's just been so where I lean on the scriptures that you know with everything inside of you that God has called you. What can men do then? Nothing. So I've been, I've been attacked by uh, the news media more than once. I've been attacked by preachers uh, more than once. It doesn't affect me. I mean, you know, I will be honest that for a short time it hurts. And then you just go on. You, you, you can't allow it to affect you. And, and when I spent and when I spend still time with the Lord, it's absolute peace in my soul. If I don't, that's when the trouble comes. Wow. So when NBC came at me, I just went to the Lord and I did exactly what I was talking about last night. I, I ministered to him. I spent time with him. I was totally at peace when others thought I would come down. I will never forget one guy uh, named Larry in, in our, uh, on our staff uh, telling me that by the, the week later there would be no church there. I said, what are you talking about? I said, who do you believe here? Well, Pastor Benny, you know, they're going to come up with all this news. I said, there's nothing I can do to stop them. Let them do what they want to do. I'm still here for one reason. I know whom I have believed. It's that simple. Because it's the Lord who calls us. And the same with Michael. A true call can never be destroyed by devils or men. Impossible. The only way ministries are destroyed is when that person walks away from Jesus. Only way. When they give up 
and walk away from the Lord. That's when they're ruined. It's over them. You want to answer that too? Oh, wow. Yeah, so this has just kind of become, I'd say in the last two years, a part of my experience uh, directly to me before it was my relationship with your dad. So, You mean the pain of it or moving on? Yeah, how do you keep the faith, how do you mm. keep focused on what you're supposed to do and not let all that distract you? Yeah, time with Jesus. That's it. That's the only. Uh, yeah. That's all it is. Yeah. yeah. I found that uh, there's a place in the Lord that's, you know, Jesus said, think of this language. I am the bread of God. One passage says who came down. Another says, who comes down. He's constantly available before our hearts, wanting to be feasted on. And the moment I begin, like the song Upper Room wrote, this is how I fight my battles. It's the, the, the battle is won at the table. And so the Lord says this, that even though we're surrounded with enemies, so they camp around us. What, what's on God's mind in Psalm 23? This feast. That he would prepare a table for us in what? In the presence of our enemies. So I would submit to you humbly. I'm completely open to correction. But I've found in my life, no matter what I face, God has one thing on his mind. Us being together. It's like he won't change the subject. And so... I come to that table knowing that Jesus is there. He's always there. He's, he's right there. As the bread of God who fulfills your soul and when people don't know you. And especially people who you, you will want to know you because you're doing your best to, to make people feel valued and Yet at the same time, there's 24 hours in a day and you have your family and you have this, this desire to share Jesus with the world. And so man sees you in a light that you don't feel like you are. Yet even in that, the Lord says, you, I'm not even going to let you defend yourself. You have to be led to this slaughter silence. And you'll find me there in the pain of this moment. And I'll become this food for you that almost makes you, almost, not completely, but you become invincible to the devil in those moments and he has to come back at a more opportune time. It's, it's like when the disciples were being beaten on the temple steps and they said, oh, we've been counted worthy to suffer for the Lord. So I, I have one prescription for me, for every issue. If I'm doing well, I need to be with Jesus. If I'm doing bad, I need to be with Jesus. I feel like I'm a better dad if I'm with Jesus. I feel like I'm, when I'm preaching, it's not time to be a preacher. It's just time to be with Jesus in front of people. And then at some point, the people disappear, and Jesus becomes really real. And that's, that's the criteria that Jesus uses to entrust us with the people. So this whole thing is about spending time with him and loving him. And it's all. Yeah. Am I wrong? No. Yeah. Pastor Randy, um, who is my pastor, and I'm I'm blessed that uh, that he's spoken into my life in, in so many ways. You you've had a um, opportunity to hire your um, sons in the ministry, and so you, like Pastor Randy said, there are times when when that dynamic is a little different. You want to just share briefly about how, what your experience has been? Sure, love to. Um, just generally kind of tying it in with our whole theme, there, there is a price. But let me tell you, the price not to follow God is so much greater. And the reward in him uh, is amazing. Uh, I have to pinch myself right now because my whole family serves and works. We work together. So one moment I got the dad hat on, the next moment I got the boss hat on the next moment i've got the 
have fun, adventure hat with them, and they're wonderful. My, my kids are wonderful in that way. And really, I don't really see much difference in my own children and my other spiritual children. We're all, it's just all amazing. I see Pastor Chris Clemens sitting over here. He's like a son to me. Pastor Tim here is like a, a son to me. And so it's, it's just doing life with people. You want to do life with people. That my family is a part of that is one of the most amazing things. But I have to tell you, we didn't do it. We didn't try to make, well, I didn't even try to make it happen. I never one time, or my wife one time said, you're going to do this, you're going to be in ministry. We just wanted them to be what Jesus wanted them to be. And yeah. we always wanted to live a life in front of them that reflected Jesus at home and wherever we were. And one of the things we made sure to do with our kids is that they had adventure serving God. And we, one of the things we say is serving God is fun. Yes, there is, there's a tag. We all know that. But, I wanna, but serving Jesus is the greatest life there is on the face of the earth. Yeah. And so our kids just showed up. And then we saw the divine hand of God. My oldest son and his wife, are exactly alike. They're very outgoing. They're very pastorly. They're very fun. And they're, and so they married similar. And they're, they're amazing pastors. And I see the gifts of God operating in them to protect the church. So I didn't do this. I Actually, I don't hire people. If they're not sent and ordained and administrated by the Holy Spirit, it's not going to happen. It had, the, you know, people say, well, where did you get those people? Just pray. Be in the will of God, and he's going to begin to send people to be developed and walk with you. And uh, I can't remember. I don't think we've ever gone out and looked for somebody. Uh, so, you know, then my, my middle son married. It's actually brothers married to sisters, which is exciting. But they're exactly alike. And they run all of the international. And it's their life. They're, they, the nations is in them. That's what they do. And then my youngest son, John, we don't know what's going to happen with him. But he's special. He's, he's, he, he's a, he, no, uh, what, I'm, what I mean by that, he's a friend of Jesus. And so like Lucy and I were, we were resting yesterday afternoon and we, I had my arm around her, and we were listening to the, to the word from Michael Miller about the house. And I said to her, I said, you know, yeah, there's a cost to walk with God. But, oh, the beauty when you endure and you go through that I said, I said to her, you know, if we hadn't followed God, where would we be? Who would my kids be married to? Where would my kids be? Where, what would they be doing? I wouldn't have the grandchildren I have. I wouldn't know you. I wouldn't have the spiritual sons and daughters. I wouldn't, the churches around the world. My wife might be blind right now. You know, the, all of these things that is so the goodness of God. Uh, so I don't know if that helps. We just wanted them to be what God wanted them to be and, and cheer for them. And they showed up and basically wouldn't leave. And uh, <laughs> they, just, they just wouldn't leave. And so I, I think that's just so precious. And then, you know, what, what they're saying about as a family you have to learn the rhythm of the inner life in walking with God. And, the, the, you know, Jesus, um, Jesus in Psalm 16, it's David's mictum, but it's really prophetic about the life of Jesus. And there were three things that he stewarded that, that, was, that defined him. 
number one was the the father's the father's desire and i think that simplifies life for us michael is it, it, if we just come to the place where our life is to answer the father's desire doesn't matter if people notice us don't notice us big is it is my life every breath an answer i say it like this some of the time is my life an answer to god's prayer i want to be an answer to it secondly jesus rested in his father's voice he stood he honored the voice of god whenever god speaks that's it just rest in it and then thirdly he treasured the presence it was the presence of God was the treasure. And he rested in that. And I think just stewarding those things, honoring those things. You know, lastly, Jesus said, you live, don't live for honor that comes from men. That's going to be a rough road. Don't live for honor. Honor, honor the presence. Honor the word. Honor the desire of the Father. Honor him, and he can reward you like nobody. And I think we sell out too cheap. I think we sell out for what men can give. And if we'll just hold out and say, no, 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 you can't. You can't. You, I don't want repay from you. I don't want what you have. I want what only my father can do. And he can put together a family. He can put together a life. He can put together beauty. That I didn't plan all this. I wasn't smart enough. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know to even try. It's just the grace of God. I'd, I'd like to say something just real quick. So when I, I have three kids, 12, 9, and 6. And so, of course, we have these dreams, what they'll be and who they'll be. But I think um, the moment I had them, I felt this responsibility as a dad to expose them to the presence of the Lord. So that's really costly. That actually takes sacrifice. And that has to go beyond my meetings. So, for instance, we're in Bethel right now. I live in Orlando. It costs a lot of money. A lot of money. And sometimes it freaks Jesse out. She's like, oh my God, look what we're spending. And, and I'm not telling you to be reckless with money. I am telling you to invest on all fronts in your children to expose them. So my son Theo comes home from school. He's in like math class. And he comes home and says, I got my first word of knowledge today. I said, what was it? He said, a lady's last name. I said, no way. He goes, then I got eight or nine in a row, dates and names. I thought, man, lay hands on me, <laughs> you know. <laughs> At that time, it was, yeah, 10 or 11. And um, little Benny got filled with the Holy Spirit a month ago. The week that we went back for a few months, and yeah. I was complaining about the cost. So his teacher, like his math teacher, is holding him up while he's falling under the power of God, telling him how to just be free and then he starts speaking in tongues while he's in class <laughs> so the moment I had children I had to stop living for myself and at least at a certain level and start saying okay there's legacy here and I've got to invest in it <coughs> and you know the presence of God recalibrates it's like tunes the piano so get them there and um, let God determine their calling you know, yeah. Pastor Benny, we, uh, we've been talking about family and of course the nucleus of the family is the husband and wife and the whole body of Christ. Husband and wife marriage. Yeah. The body of Christ watched you go through such an agonizing time a few years ago and come on the other side of that with such victory. And those of us that were praying for you and your family um, are so grateful to see how God has just brought wholeness there. Well, what are some challenges for couples in ministry that you could speak to? That's a big question. Well, first of all, each situation is different. My situation, my wife and I have always been in love very much. To this day, we are deeply in love. And uh, Suzanne came from a very famous Christian family. 
uh, very powerful. Her father used to play piano for Smith Wigglesworth, British. And uh, <clears throat> her father began Charisma Magazine. Steve Strang was one of the kids in church. Her daddy was the pastor of the largest Assemblies of God Church in America called Calvary Assembly Orlando, Florida. So when we married, <clears throat> the Lord was in it in a very powerful way and a beautiful beginning. And her dad, who was the greatest Bible teacher I ever heard in my life, uh, imagine uh, someone who uh, grew up under Smith's Will Wigglesworth ministry and <clears throat> his own father traveled with Smith. And his knowledge of the Bible was just amazing. We would all sit and cry listening to him minister the word. And in 1981... He left the church uh, because of some uh, problem with women. And when he left the church, it was a very tragic experience for the family. Now, I began uh, in ministry in 74 traveling to many churches in the United States. And I met Roy in uh, 78 in Singapore. He and I became friends. And then uh, he and I decided I would marry his daughter before he even told her. And she came home from Evangel College and her father informed her that she will marry me. It was an instant love affair, of course. And uh, like I said, uh, an amazing beginning. But, but let me go back. I want to I wanna just finish this because it's important. Uh, when he left the church in, in, in 81, <clears throat> that's when the troubles began. Uh, because of the way he was treated by Christians. Some Christians can be the meanest people on earth. And rather than forgiving him and helping him, this amazing man, they condemned him. And uh, I don't want to say a whole lot more. I should not because I really don't want to. But uh, Suzanne uh, and the family began to experience a lot of pain. Uh, so much so her brother was found dead in his apartment. Her two sisters left the faith because of the way they saw her father treated. They were not even allowed to attend church. And uh, Roy, her dad, came to me one day and he said, uh, why don't you start a church in Orlando? I said, I don't want to. I said, I'm an evangelist. And he talked to me for a long time about doing a church. And God was truly in it. And when we started in 83, uh, we started packed at the Youth uh, for Christ building in Orlando. We, we grew from uh, zero to 10,000 in two years. We began church uh, March. By December, we were building our sanctuary in construction and uh, then uh, Suzanne uh, asked me to hire her dad which was a mistake because his problem continued and I had to fire him it's not easy to talk about I hired him a second time because of my wife and fired him again well, the result was, you can imagine the pain in her. 
because I could not allow a man on my staff that had that problem. As great as he was of a Bible teacher, but then he repented, broke down, God forgave him. We all for have forgiven him, and he died a few years ago in peace and purity. He would weep, wept and cried for years after that. He had a great impact on Michael's life, on Jessica's life. We would all sit and ask him Bible questions, and he from memory would give us chapter and verse. Incredible life, even though, sadly, he had a struggle because he was molested when he was a little boy by his aunt. You should not have asked me that question. No, we need it. We need this. And then Suzanne, uh, as a result of the pain, uh, began to take pills mentally to help her with her emotions. And uh, amazingly, she didn't that, did not die because the, she took so much of them. Uh, it's amazing she survived. Uh, she took more of these pills than that uh, lady who died. Uh, what was her name again? Whitney Houston. And, uh, and that's what caused our, our, our divorce. The divorce wasn't caused because Sue and I had a problem with our relationship. Nothing like that, never. The problem was Suzanne was no longer the Suzanne I married because of the drugs. They were mind-altering drugs. And she made a decision to go to the Berry Fort Clinic, and they cleaned her up completely, and I regained my wife. And uh, our love never died for each other. I adore that woman to this day. And uh, we remarried in 2013. Uh, I know that. It's yourself, self -made. He was, rem he was reminding me, see? In 2013. <laughs> Just trying to help you. You thank you, thank you. Uh, but but our, our, our uh, experience is unique uh, that God restored us. But he restored us because the divorce was caused by pain that none of us were really uh, responsible for. We didn't, uh, were not the ones that caused it all. It just affected us. And ministry is a very dangerous place. Uh, but uh, I've, I've known many who've been divorced who are not remarried or married someone else. Many of them are successful in ministry. Others are not. But I would say this. I think the problem is uh, we are too influenced by the world rather than the Word of God. Yeah. Wow. Because the Lord uh, makes it very clear on who to marry, who to choose. I've learned a lot, and I've told people, don't marry anyone before you know your call. Find your call before you find your wife or your husband. Because when you find your call first, make sure she fits the call or he fits the call. If God calls you as a lady, make sure who you marry fits the call, not the other way around. Because if you marry them first, before the call, you're going to have problems after the call. Be very careful with that. And never marry anyone if you hate their family. <laughs> never. That's a big problem. I don't like your mother. 
Well, you better not marry if you don't like the mother. Why? Because she, because that's just the way it is. Because uh, do they turn out like their mother? Not always. Uh. I used to say they turn out like their mother, but I don't believe that no more. That's not really true at all. No, it's not true. It's not true. I, I didn't not. hear you. I'm telling you one more time, it's not true. I never heard what you said the first time. <laughs> <laughs> Shall I pray for your healing? Yes, do it. <laughs> um, this I used to say that a girl becomes louder. like a mother. Louder. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it's not true, baby. It's not true. It's what the Lord does in that girl yeah. that okay. matters. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if the Lord doesn't, she will become like her mother. <laughs> okay. That's true. If God doesn't intervene, they become like their mother. And all the husbands Good or bad, it doesn't huh? matter. But if God intervenes, they become just like the Lord, not their mother. <laughs> but I want to say one more thing about divorce because I think it's important for these people. A lot of them are young. Pray for me. That's <laughs> great. He, he asked me the question I, he should not have asked, but he did. Do not divorce. Don't divorce. Because it's painful and destructive to children and family. So my advice is it's quite simple to those who are still single. Do what Queen Elizabeth told her children to do. You know what she said to them? When Charles married and he divorced Diana, and then Andrew married and he, he uh, divorced whatever her name was, the, the red-headed girl, <laughs> then, then she told the next one, she said, you will, you will court for five years before you marry. Because it's been discovered by studies, it takes that long to get to know the lady. What about the, the lady, guy? Not, not the, man, the guy, right? The lady. The, lady? The, the guys figured out in the first because two months. Women, the guys we women, know wow. women are harder to discover right than men. I, <laughs> this is really That's happening. probably all a true ladies, statement. All the ladies said. Amen. Wait, what did you say? What was the last thing? I said, it's, look, look. It's easy to discover what's inside a man. It's what? very hard to discover yeah. what's inside a lady. Men just feed because, them and what Because <laughs> when God made you, we were asleep. Oh. <laughs> I don't even have a comeback for that. <laughs> we don't know what God, we don't know what God put inside of you. Remember, when God made the woman, the man was sleeping. He didn't know what God did with her. Okay, so we're going to turn this around and go back spiritual. Um, I kind of like where it's at, I have to say. all the ladies said... <laughs> so it, takes, it takes five years, they say uh, now, to get to know it? what a girl is like. I cannot who, who wait to Queen read Elizabeth. the comments oh. on the Facebook <laughs> oh my live gosh. feed. I cannot <laughs> wait to read the comments that we're going to get for that. Um, no, I'm, man. I'm, I'm, I'm done talking about it. Okay. <laughs> Yes. Okay. So <laughs> I don't even know where to go from there. So we, we, we have to wrap it up. We've got probably five to ten more minutes left. So if we can go a little spiritual, I'm going to try to go that way. Um, for both of you, this is a two-part question oh, for great. both of you um, that we all could receive from. Dad, you're obviously a father. You're not even in the mode now. You're like, you're just like having fun, right? Yeah, he's, he's giving me that I look. I'm answering the questions you people ask me. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, mm, as a father awesome. and Michael as a son, pretend that you had one last conversation that you could have <laughs> with Michael. That's spiritual. And Michael, if you could... What I said was very spiritual. That was, I know. Oh, it, it was. It was amazing. Adam and Eve. Huh? It was. Bible. About Adam and Eve, you bet. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I'm <laughs> so if you... <laughs> if he should just be a marriage counselor. If this you doesn't see, work, see, right? right, right it, yeah. I, want, I want to say something. God gave Adam... <laughs> wait, wait, hold, 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 hold. God gave Adam the position and he gave his wife the influence 
and influence is more powerful than position. Because God said, don't eat it. And she said, eat. He said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> And all the ladies said, <laughs> You're going to pick up some new women partners no, no, for no, that no, one. No. Yeah. Okay, now, now, I, now I'm done. Okay. For now, I'm done. So, okay, so to wrap it up before we're done, I wanted to ask you both this question. If, what would I tell him? If you could speak to him as a father and Michael, um, you to him as a son. If you had just what you are believing for, for him, how he can finish his life strong, and dad, what you're believing for him as a son that you want him to learn from you. What would you tell Michael? If you could just give him any advice in the world, what would it be? I told Michael already this, but I'll repeat it now. The secret to longevity in ministry and in the Lord, especially in the Lord, is number one, build a reservoir of God's word in your life because troubles will come and when troubles come you'll know where to go to make sure it's inside of you and Michael knows that 40 percent of pastors and preachers in this country have not read the whole Bible that's a fact I've I've had a show of hands in my own meetings 80% of Christians have not read the whole Bible. That's also a fact. If I should ask here how many of you have not read the whole Bible, I'll probably shock you all. So you have to know the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation. And read that Bible at least three times a year. So what? Three times a year. And it is easily done. Very easily done. I do it. Why, why can't you? So, you have to know the word. You have to. And what I told Michael is, the word of God is about one person. His name is Jesus. He already asked me that question. I'm just repeating it. I said, number two. The word will cause you to cling to the Son of God. By the word, only by what he said, God said, can we get close to his Son? Because otherwise we have no, no uh, foundation, no, uh, no strength. And number three, never leave your anointing. Never walk away from your call. And Michael asked me that question. You may remember this. It's been a few years. He said, why? I said, because outside your anointing is leprosy. Sin. The anointing protects from leprosy. And leprosy is sin in the Bible. When King Uzziah walked out of his anointing, he became a leper. When Saul walked away from his anointing, he was rejected. So there's a call on his life. That is his protection. So if God called you to be in the healing ministry, don't go somewhere else and do something different. Stay in it. Because in that circle, there's protection. And it all begins with the word. And I'm, that's what I pray for him. I love him. Deep, deeply, and he knows that. And, and I want Michael to know the word of God better than any man on the planet. Because that's the secret to his future, your future, and my grandbaby's future. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Wow, that's good, huh? I had a pastor work with me of a big church. And we went, I took him with me to Patmos, Greece. And I was teaching the book of Revelation outside the cave where Paul 
uh, where John had the vision. And uh, after about the third or fourth program, I got tired of being the only one who was teaching. So I looked at him and said, listen, I paid your way first class. I paid your hotel. You need to work. <laughs> so you need to talk back to me. You don't just sit there and stare at me the whole time. I did four programs. And the man said, not a word. The fifth program, I said, now it's time for you to give me some feedback. He looks and said, I know nothing about the book of Revelation. So what? He said, I've never read it. I said, what are you doing being a pastor? <laughs> that man had 5,000 people in his church. I said, what other books have you not read? I have this on camera. Jeff Pittman recorded the whole thing. We still have it. I said, what other books have you not read? He said, well, I've read Genesis and I've read parts of Exodus. And I have not read Leviticus yet. And I've read parts of, I still remember every word he said. And I've read parts of Numbers and I did read Deuteronomy. And then he went on to tell me how many books he had read fully. I said, you're in danger of destruction. I said, what do you preach then? He said, I preach what I read in books. I said, what? Oh, come on, Pastor Benny, word for word. Come on, Pastor Benny, you're dealing with God's agenda for the ages. I have to deal with my people's troubles. I said, what do you mean? Well, he said, my people have all these troubles and I have to find answers. I said, the answers are in the Bible. Not in some books you buy at the store. And then I warned him, I said, if you don't know the word, the enemy will destroy you one day. He went to New York, overdosed on drugs, and died. Very famous guy. I won't even mention his name. It's not right. And we know that from his wife that he overdosed. Because he used to do drugs before he got saved. Without the word, the devils came right back. So it's the word, guys. It's the word. It's the word that will keep you. Nowhere else to go but the word of God. Get to know your Bibles. Amen. Get to know the word. And that's what I tell Michael. That's what I want for him. Because the word will keep him close to Jesus. And the word will keep him under his anointing. That's all there is to it. Give me a five. Wow. That's it. So, uh, that was I want to hear what Michael has I to say. I said do I, so. so. Is this the last thing I would this ever is, tell him? This is the last, and this is also our last uh, question because of time. So, like, but, yeah. he's going to heaven and he's, he's, yeah, like, it's, okay. he's towards the end of his life. Whoa. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta, I've, I've got to tell you something funny. When I was in the hospital, they put me under <laughs> the... the what do you call that? Sedation. Yeah. When I came out of my uh, sedation, I was giving him every chapter in the book of Genesis. And singing hymns, going into the machines that were scanning his heart. He was out reciting chapters and singing. He didn't even know he was doing it. It was amazing. Because when the word is in you, it's in you. Give me a five. A five. There you go. <laughs> and, I made him, and I also made him laugh when I came out of my... Yeah, let's not go there. <laughs> Can I say something That's funny not. real quick? Pardon? When he was going down to his procedure, he go, was going, being, what, going to your procedure in the hospital when they took you from the ICU to oh, yeah, go get yeah. one of the CAT scans or something. He goes, wait, wait, wait. Get me my sunglasses so nobody will recognize me. I said, if you put those things on, everybody's going to look at you like you're crazy. Give me back those sunglasses right now. It's a little fancy. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was just so funny. It was, it was so, oh. We had so many laughs, actually, at that time. I should tell everything about me. That was a, ca there was, it was a Catholic hospital, and he was. Under sedation. Under sedation. Yeah. He was going, are you Catholic? Are you ca I know are, the Pope. I know the Pope. I know the Pope. He's my good friend. <laughs> Have you heard of me? I'm Benny Hinn. He goes, Yeah, it, it was like, he goes, uh, You know, 
You know, all the, I have friends who are natural doctors, and they think you're all crazy. They all think you're crazy. Yeah. yeah. You were saying, I mean, I almost wanted to put my hand over your mouth well, at one point. It was on funny, yeah. I didn't know what I was saying because I was under that whatever. You're very funny in general, but under sedation, you're a comedian. It was the funniest yeah, was thing. Good. I needed to laugh. You were so funny. Yeah. But, um, yes, Michael. It's, Wait, yeah. one second. Before yeah. you, because you're going to kind of wrap it up. But there was one thing that I wanted to ask Are you. Are you talking to me? To already? you, Pastor Benny, oh. right? Because when the, that's going to segue into what Michael's going to close out with. He's a son of yours in the spirit. Right. He's running the race with you. What part of his inheritance from you spiritually will he not, do you believe that he will not receive until you go to be with Jesus? I believe with all of my heart wow. that when I go home, God will impart more to Michael. And here's why. Because an office is never vacant. Never vacant. The office has to be filled. So a, there's no vacancies in the kingdom of God, you know. So when Moses went to heaven, Joshua took the office, the same office. And God is the one who ordains who gets into that office. And I have no doubt in my mind now that Michael will receive way more when I go. Yeah, absolutely. Amen. Because God has touched our hearts yeah. are so one. Yeah. You know, I, he knows, the world knows I love him so dearly. But it's not about just loving him. It's about the oneness we have in the spirit. Because Michael, when, when he calls me about a question he has and such things, uh, I was, we were um, talking about a few weeks ago about the Lord when he rose from the dead. And as Tim was driving me in the car, I'm talking to Michael, and the anointing hit the car. And the revelations that came out of my mouth about Mary Magdalene to answer the question. And Michael was blessed, and I was more blessed than he was as we're talking. But the, we've had many such experiences where the Lord just moved into our conversation, you know. So it's not about just son-in-law. It's about oneness in spirit. And that is what assures me that when the Lord takes me home, something additional is going to happen. And we don't know what that is, but it's very biblical too. And I'm so proud of him. I love him. Yeah, there are certain experiences I have that I know he's the only one who can put context and language to it. Like the other day I called you about I know. one. and Yeah, I, I would say... I'm just echoing and bouncing off that. I know we have to go, but there are certain uh, when he, when when he talks, it plays to the strings of my heart. It's like, okay, this is this is this is me. Like this is I don't know how to explain it. Like a stream is a very weak word because it's used so loosely. Yeah. Uh, if we what we used to do is drive down PCH and just listen to Miss Kuhlman, and we'd come alive. And uh, so there are certain reserved holy encounters or questions that I know there's no one on the earth. And I feel like God surrounded me with the greats, like today's greats. I mean, and it's just the favor of the Lord. I didn't earn it. And they can help me with so much. But the, the high, deep, hidden realms that are taking place inside of me when Bub talks. Uh, he's the only one I can go to. I, I can go to Jess, and usually her answer is, you need to call my dad <laughs> for certain things. They're like, I mean, the other day I called him, and I said, look, I've got to know what's going on with these experiences because 
if I don't. There are experiences so deep in the Lord that if you don't get truth founded in the scriptures, they'll, they'll mess you. I mean, not mess you up is a bad word, but you don't know what to do with them. And so he's been that voice to me. Yeah. What would you then say to him? How okay, would you want so I'm to there finish? at his bed and he's going to heaven. You're going to paint the, the scene, mall, I'm just saying. <laughs> You're waiting for your uh, in increased inheritance at this yeah. point. <laughs> uh, well, I'd say thank you. And I would, you know. I tell you what I want you to pray for, though. Well, first I'd say I need a building and $13 million to get me help with that. <laughs> and I'd get that out of the way, tickle your ear. And then I, I would, I'd ask for, I'd, 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 I'd get in your lap and uh, tickle your ear. <laughs> then I'll give and you I'd, half of my I'd, kingdom. I'd move, I'd move your crystallized hair to the side. And I would, I would uh, tickle your ear and say, I need thirteen million dollars. No, I would say. I, I'd say uh, I love you and thank you. And I mean, how do you, what can you say to someone who leads you to, to the Lord? But what would you want for him? What would want I want for, for him, him right now? I know what he wants. I would want him, uh, I would want a, him to buy us a building. And then I, <laughs> I would, well, I'm saying this brother Copeland told me to believe for it three times a day, Kelly, so that's where I'm going. <laughs> So, uh, I want, I want Bub to, I feel like there are a few things regarding Jesus' image that are going to determine the quality of its destiny. Obviously, one is spending time with Jesus. Two is our family. Three is faithfulness to the word, obviously, not in a specific order. But, lastly, I know in my heart the way I handle him, the way I honor him, the way I treat him, that will have a major influence on what I and our movement walks into. So I handle him lightly, and I know when, when it's us messing around, and I know when he steps into his office like he did last night. And, so I don't think I've ever told you that, but I'm well aware of one thing in this regard that a whole lot will depend on for all of us, how I uh, tangibly honor uh, my father-in-law. So in saying that, I feel like it's part of our destiny as a movement to reintroduce him to a generation. And I'm glad glad to step away in these settings, even though we're believing for the money and the faith and putting it on. And it's a pleasure for me to take a step back and say, this is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So and to wrap it up, I want him to go out shining with such glory. Please, Lord, please. And I want him to to, I want the simplicity of 74 That's what I want. to become the simplicity of this latter, this last portion of this race. I want, I want, um, I want the deep realms of God to be his. I want the love of Jesus to burn in him so brightly, and it already is, but I want more for him, and, and I want, um, I want our generation to know the real Benny who sat with Upper Room last night for two hours and gave his heart away in a little office. All of us packed in there. I, number one, I want him to love Jesus more than he could ever imagine. Please, number two, I want, I want people to, to love him and know who he really is. Yeah. And I have a prayer request. <laughs> and I have a prayer for request for all of you. You're going to ask me for money? No. Oh. <laughs> Seriously, here's my prayer request. That I would love my master more than any 
thing in life that at my last breath, with my last breath, I would worship him. Yeah. I want to die preaching. I don't want to die in some home waiting to die. <clears throat> I want to die on the platform. Wow. I do. I've oh, I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, take me home while I'm preaching. Um. Huh? No, I, oh, I, I want to go, I want to go home preaching the gospel. And I want to go home with loving him more than I've ever loved him. And, and, the, and the next 20 years of my life, I want to accomplish more than I have in the last 43 years. <laughs> really, I mean that. I mean that. Yeah. That's what I want. Wow. I want to enter heaven looking at his smile. Kent Malax asked me a question one day. He said, what do you want when you see the Lord? I said, my reward is one thing, his smile. That's all we want. Yeah, I don't want to be in that meeting. <laughs> oh, I think we have great service. <laughs> it's... <laughs> Let's go, man. Oh, my goodness. Do you know, do you know that that's happened more than once to yeah. preachers? Yeah. Yes. A man of God in Min Minneapolis, Minnesota was preaching in... Souls Harbor, right? Yeah, Souls Harbor. Right. And he said to the crowd, his wife told me, he said, yeah. I'm going home, bye, <laughs> love you all. <laughs> and, and, and they thought he was going home like home, like to his house. <laughs> and he sat down, he said, I'll see you all later, God love you, bye-bye. Gone. It's done. Yeah. I wow. To see. Yeah, he died. When he sat down, he just put his head down. That's the way Jim's daddy went home. At the pulpit. No. He told his mom, his wife, "I'm going home." Same with Rex. I'll see you in heaven. Yeah. Love you. Sat wow. down. Was gone. Wow. Wow. I'm I'm done talking. Well, <laughs> Pastor. You want to ask me one more? No, no, I can't please, ask you anymore. No. I, I, I have several more that I'd love to, but we can't because of yeah, time. Please, no but more. I want to tell you this. Um, I, I have, it's been 10 years since I started working for BHM. And um, my grandmother was a partner with you. And um, when I was a kid, every day at 2.30, I would watch This Is Your Day. And... I want you to know that there's a generation of us that still so values you, and we need you. We do. Isn't it true? Look, isn't it true? It's true. It's true. Yeah. It's true. It's true. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for being so steady. Yes. Yes. We're going to take, um, we're going to break right here. We're going to take a moment, just pray. Um, and then we're going to go have some lunch. Those of you that are going to the partner breakfast, I mean, sorry, partner lunch. Um, and then be back here early tonight. Service starts at, yeah, Pastor Benny will be at the lunch. It is for partner, it's for people who want to partner, so partner, okay? Um, and then tonight service starts at 630 but there's a 5 o'clock teaching session. Oh, yeah. There's a 5 o'clock healing class. Pastor Randy Pastor will be leading it. Listen, if you need a miracle, come to this class. If you want to move in miracles, pray for the sick more effectively, get to this class. Because there's something up with your body that needs to go get here at 5 o'clock, okay? You will not stay sick after tonight. After tonight's meeting, combined with the class, you will leave healed in Jesus' name, okay? In Jesus name. Let's pray really <clears throat> Lord Jesus. Thank you for the wonderful privilege to sit in this moment. We've never seen this moment before. We'll never see it again. Thank you for your servants. Thank you, Father, for Pastor Benny. Thank you for Michael. Thank you for Pastor Randy and Jess. How you've allowed us to share this time together. Thank you for the wisdom that was imparted, the insight, the treasure that came through your sons and daughters' lips in this time. We promise to cherish it, Lord. 
to steward it well, to protect it. We thank you for giving them long life, long, strong, healthy life. Thank you for granting their request that they will finish strong. Help us all to finish strong. Loving you, Jesus. Loving you. We love you, Father, and we thank you again. For your sake we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll see you over at the partner breakfast. Make sure that if you are leaving to take all of your stuff with you because we will be clearing, doing a full sweep of the facility before our evening session. God bless you.